Uh, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation to Vancouver. It's very, very nice to be here, and thanks to the Institute for the invitation and for all those uh, organizations that have sponsored uh, this event. I'm going to talk about the, the, the Canada-EU trade negotiations on the FTA, but I, I want to do that against a bit of a back, background, a background in EU trade policy, but also taking it even a bit wider to look at, a back, to look, to look at, at the background in terms of the factors shaping EU external economic policy. Um, because I think there's some quite interesting contrasts, comparisons that you can make between trade, for example, and the European response to the, the current financial crisis, economic crisis, and uh, other policy areas, such as environment, where the European response has been very different. Um, so I'm going to start um, by... Um, just going through some of the factors that I think you have to bear in mind when you're trying to understand what is shaping European external economic policy. I'll then look at trade in particular, and I'll move fairly swiftly through to get to the, the nuts and bolts of the Canada-EU trade agreement, because it is a very timely program. Um, I think the, um, the formal negotiation should start should be launched on May the 6th in Prague, the meeting in Prague, uh, unless something <laughs> very bad goes b wrong between now and then, I think they will be launched then. So it's a, it's a very timely uh, conference indeed. Um, first of all, let me say a little bit about the factors that shape EU trade policy or EU external economic policy. Some of you will be very familiar with these concepts, others may be less so. Um, but one of the, uh, I'll just run through them quickly. I mean, the first issue is competence. By this, uh, we mean whether it's European community competence or whether it's member state competence that shapes outcomes. Um, and you would expect if it's community competence such as in trade, exclusive community competence in trade, then this will lead to a more uh, cohesive common policy. Uh, the institutional setting is very important in terms of understanding external European policy because this is the kind of principal agent relationship in which you have one negotiator for the EU, perhaps, or maybe you have more than one negotiator, more than one agent and a set of principles, the main ones being, of course, the 27 uh, <coughs> member states of the EU, but there are others. So the institutional setting, um, you would expect if you have lots of players, lots of veto players, as it's uh, put in the literature, then you would expect uh, less of a chance of common external policies. Um, the next one down is the acquis, the acquis communautaire. In other words, the domestic policies that have been agreed within the EU. <clears throat> this is really shaped by a stage of, integration, of the integration process in that field, different in trading goods to financial regulation. And the more integrated you have <clears throat> your domestic policies, the more you have a common external base on which to to lead, to pursue, persecute your foreign policy, foreign economic policies. Sector interests are always important, so you'll have protectionist, uh, liberal sectors involved, uh, and the balance between those is always um, important, uh, at least in determining the content of policy. But external drivers have been very important, <coughs> even in the field of trade. Um, the need to have a cohesive position vis-a-vis -vis other major trading partners has one been one of the major factors pushing the EU towards a more common policy. General norms here, by this I mean norms that aren't really codified in the existing agreements, not codified in the acquis. And these are norms that have been developed really through political dialogue discussions within the EU 
And I think here you, you notice that in the environment field, the EU has developed quite strong, um, a strong consensus on the need for sustainable development, lower carbon growth, for example. And then finally, foreign policy issues, which will shape uh, at least the choice of uh, partners in terms of uh, bilateral trade negotiations, for example. If you, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can, if you take those various factors and you look at EU trade policy, you can begin to see how they've had different effects over, over the over a course of time. Uh, and looking at multilateral trade negotiations, going back in how the Europe, how Europe has evolved its common uh, external trade position. Right at the beginning, of course, you had a customs union, so you had to have a common external tariff, so you had to have a common trade policy. Uh, but the need to have a common policy was also influenced strongly by the uh, challenge coming from the US in terms of the Kennedy round negotiations, because the US wanted to reduce tariffs and therefore erode the European preference and challenge the common agricultural policy. So even at the early stages, there was an external factor involved. If you move on into the 1970s, the Tokyo round, when trade, incidentally, was also shaped by um, major changes in the financial system, the monetary system. At this time, Europe was still on the defensive on trade policy because it hadn't really developed a strong acquis communautaire, a strong internal policy. Uh, it was reactive and it tended to defend the existing um, policies of the member states, which were still quite uh, <coughs> defensive. You had a common uh, external tariff policy, but you didn't have a single market at this time. In the Uruguay round, things changed really because of developments within the European Union. More dynam dynamism inside the uh, the EU in the shape of the single market. This led to a stronger policy in terms of external trade, one which was more liberal and one which supported uh, a more rules-based multilateral trading system. So the key, the development of the internal policies was very important in shaping that transition in European trade policy. Under the WTO, in other words, um, since the mid-1990s, European trade policy has become more proactive, less defensive, and it's been the EU that's been pushing for a comprehensive multilateral trade agenda. In previous decades, it was always the US that pushed for this. Um, that change, I think, has come around, uh, come about in part because of the development of the FP, but also uh, the development of um, a desire on the part of the EU to shape international trade in, uh, to reflect its own internal norms and policies. So if you take the factors I introduced in the earlier slide, you can go through and see how these have played an important part in different stages of European trade policy. Um, moving on now to look at um, EU policy in preferential trade agreements or free trade areas. Um, it's quite helpful, I think, if you're trying to understand the background to the Canada-EU negotiations, if you understand the evolution of EU policy in FTAs. Uh, they were, in the past, always called, there, there was this pyramid of preferences that was used to describe European uh, preferential agreements. And the preferences, um, took different forms, but many of them were motivated by uh, factors that were other than commercial factors. You had agreements with the African, Caribbean, and Pacific <coughs> states, the ACP states. Um, <coughs> in the uh, Lomé agreements and then the Cotonou agreement subsequently, these were preferential agreements which were really motivated by development policy, or if you like, by the colonial legacy of some of the EU member states. 